today we're going to talk about the seven liberal arts and sciences and what they mean to masons and really what they can mean to anybody in general because these are ideas that have been around since um ancient greek time even some of these ideas have been around um long before and the idea for this kind of came up when uh two weeks ago we did a presentation on the um masonic virtues and how they again relate to people in everyday lives so again following kind of the same format we'll talk about the liberal arts and sciences where they originated what are they i mentioned previously just kind of in in an extra slide that uh, they're split up into a group of three called the trivium and a group of four called the quadrivium and how each one of the, they got separated um, and then how they ended up just being brought together into one group of, of arts and sciences kind of again what they what they mean how they're how they can be applied and then especially for masons what they they mean to us and again this is an open presentation so you know there's nothing uh, top secret going on in here but it is good education that really anybody can use the seven liberal arts and sciences and this is a uh, you know medieval renaissance painting and this is when a lot of these ideas you know it's the renaissance that's kind of when people were really focusing on education and not just focusing on education they were also revisiting um even to them classics so they're going back to ancient roman ancient greek latin texts and they're they're reading over all this to to see what you know thought has been happening back then and how it can be applied to their lives in in the in the renaissance in the middle middle ages so you get a lot of these paintings if you look for liberal arts and sciences and some of the imagery and not unlike the masonic virtues it tends to be you know women figures for each of these liberal arts and sciences and some of them i can kind of piece together you got music um you got a globe um but contrary to the cardinal virtues there's not a specific um representation of what each one of those um sciences or arts specifically is but you tend to see them grouped together and there's a lot of different um images and, and pictures and paintings that, that are pretty neat to be able to see what some of these arts and sciences were and and how um, these scenes of education were depicted so i mentioned going back to the classics and these are slides that i took from the previous presentation back to talking about plato and the republic so the you know renaissance th thinkers they kind of went back to the beginning of when um philosophical thought and ideas were being written down were being um transcribed and some of these um dialectics these discussions that the philosophers had and the ideas they had you know were used to inform thinkers of of the renaissance times in what they were writing what they were teaching what they were learning about so the republic uh you know i mentioned it's a socratic dialogue so it's um it's written by plato socrates is the main character and it involves him going around talking with different people having discussions about whatever topics um interested him and this was written in around 375 again i mentioned previously king solomon's temple was destroyed in 575 bc so um there's a lot of symbolism for king solomon's temple among among masons and so seeing that some of these um you know masonic ideas weren't really officially written down until later you know um it's it's kind of a similar idea of just grabbing ideas and thoughts from different eras different times and m trying to make a cohesive unit out of it but the republic focuses primarily on justice what the just society would be um what the just man or woman would be and then the education needed to create these just citizens so what um specific things should be focused on within education and in the republic uh socrates talked about the quadrivium so four studies that he called the the secondary part of the curriculum so arithmetic arithmetic geometry astronomy and music and they built on what was called the trivium which is you know lower division of the seven liberal arts and it's grammar logic and rhetoric 
And what's interesting about this is the trivium, which you kind of think grammar, logic, and rhetoric were the, the building blocks, they didn't get um, described as the trivium. They weren't recognized as these three things until the Middle Ages when they were kind of, again, um, bundled together into a cohesive system. So you really had the quadrivium for a while before anybody thought about adding the other three as a, a cohesive system of, of education. So the seven liberal arts and sciences, you have the four scientific arts, music, arithmetic, geometry, and astronomy, and I put these in different order depending on uh, where I was cutting and pasting from, primarily Wikipedia though, um, or astrology. Uh, we're pretty much focusing on astronomy here though. We're not, um, you know, there's, there's, I don't think there's anything in the Masonic texts about uh, our astrological signs or, or um, any of the planets, but you never know. Um, so they were known from the time of Bothius, who was a Roman senator and philosopher uh, onwards. So he was kind of one of the first ones who started talking about um, this, uh, this quadrivium and, and gave it that name. Um, you know, kind of a little bit even past uh, when Plato was writing the Republic. So after the ninth, ninth century, then the other three, the grammar, logic, and rhetoric, were grouped together as the trivium, and then the the twofold form of the seven liberal arts and, and sciences. That's what um, you know medieval colleges began studying and focusing on. And during the Middle Ages, during the Renaissance, you know the Age of Enlightenment, logic came to take predominance because that was kind of one of the biggest. Um, principles and especially when it comes to something like you you have logic but even in uh, arithmetic geometry you have a lot of um mathematical proofs that still use the same sort of of focus that uh, logic does of being able to take statements and and form coherent arguments so we're going to start with the trivium though because they are the the basic building blocks needed I'm gonna take a drink of water real quick. So this uh, is an interesting image that I kept finding while I was trying to find good images of the trivium. And it has this idea that, you know, truth is in the center and from truth you get consciousness, human consciousness. And from truth and consciousness, you get grammar, you get logic and you get rhetoric, but you can't make the leap just from grammar to rhetoric, they all have to kind of come through uh, the idea of consciousness and truth. So it's it's something that happens through through learning. You can't just kind of um, have one just, just show up all of a sudden. So grammar is, you know, the set of structural rules governing the composition of clauses, phrases, and words in, an, in a natural language. So yeah, I don't know if they still do it in school. They were still doing it when I was in school, but you had to diagram sentences. And it would you would take the statement and break it up into, you know, adjectives, nouns, verbs, um, and adverbs. And that kind of gave you the the structure of the sentence itself. So yeah, that's kind of a a complex way of looking at grammar because it's got like rules and, and syntax. But what another big portion of grammar is, is you learn what things are. So it's it's the ability to identify things. And you don't, you study grammar to get like the rules and the, the syntax, but a lot of it you kind of get from hearing other people speaking. So it's, it's really kind of a more ingrained knowledge. Yeah, you know, I've got a, uh, three and a half year old, and he says things like last day instead of yesterday because he knows last week, last month, last year. Uh, so, you know, following that pattern, he kind of put two and two together that yesterday was actually would be last day, which makes sense, but, you know, we have yesterday instead. So it's it's this idea that, you know, without studying, it's just something that you hear, you build these patterns on your own just by hearing people talk and, and by talking. But what grammar also does is 
it lets us define the objects and information perceived by the five senses. So we talk a little bit about the five senses in masonry as well, but if you've got something that you're looking at or seeing or hearing, smelling, tasting, the ability to be able to accurately describe it is pretty important. And that's kind of the whole basic, uh, the uh, basics of grammar, of linguistics, of how um, language and words are used. So, um, you know, obviously without any of that, you aren't really going to be able to convey any sort of information. So building on that, you have this idea of logic. So it's uh, the mechanics of thought and analysis. So part of it's identifying fallacious arguments, you know, the straw man, um, you know, I took, I took a attacking faulty logic class, but I can't remember most of them. Um, but it's, it's identifying those and, and using statements to remove contradictions and produce factual knowledge that can be trusted. Um, yeah, it's it's. Yeah, I talk a little bit about knowledge here and factual, but but part of what's interesting about logic as well is you can really strip out this idea of knowledge and truth, and just say have statements that are, you know, if statement A is true, then statement B is true, and then if you have statement A and that's true, then that follows that statement B is going to be true. So you can actually strip out a lot of the um, meaning, the syntax, the the emotions behind um, arguments and discussions and, and really focus on just the logic. So there's, um, you know, this uh, idea that you have inference, how you can take um, one idea and get to the other, and you accept a proposition, so the conclusion, and you kind of prove through it, and, and it's on the basis of other proposition, the premises, and then you have your your logical steps as you as you follow through. And logic is is roughly divided into informal versus formal. And informal um, logic actually does um, talk about the logical fallacies and some of the ways of structuring arguments. So it's not um, quite as focused on syntax about using statements and premises to get to conclusions. But formal logic is when you really start to develop these these um, rules and these structures and these these patterns to be able to take a entire um, paragraph of something, distill it into these variables. You know, you have constants that you might use, and then you can use these symbolic elements to take, you know, replace all the words with just this this pattern of um, that almost boils it back down to, to math, that if all of these statements are true, then the conclusion logically follows to be true. You might not agree with it, but logically it's it's a true statement. And it's a really interesting concept. Yeah, you know, I majored in, in philosophy. Logic wasn't my strongest point, but you know, now I do computer stuff, and again, some of these terms, this and, not, or, exclusive, or, that's all stuff that, that shows up in computer science as well, and even to the point where the one of the logic classes I took was also required uh, studying for computer scientists, so it was a pretty interesting mix of, of students in that class. And then finally, rhetoric, that's uh, applying language in order to instruct and to persuade the listener or the reader. So Aristotle, who was Plato's student, he defined rhetoric as the faculty is of observing in any given case the available means of, of persuasion. So, you know, you have all these different um, ways that you can go about convincing listeners of whatever you're trying to convince them. So they, he had logos, pathos, and ethos. So logos is, is your word choice, the, the ideas, the statements that you're using. Pathos is um, emotional cues. It's your ability to, to read the audience or to make an impassioned plea to get the audience to um, empathize with you. And then ethos is, is based on your character of, is it something that you know, universally the group agrees with or is good for them or um, 
something something along those lines of being able to um, use all of these elements kind of as needed. You have to be able to to switch and move back and forth between them to really not only get your point across, but to also be able to convince somebody of what you're trying to um, persuade them or or um, discuss. So you know, carrying on into Roman times, there's five phases, five parts of developing um, rhetoric. So you have invention, which is discovery. It's doing the, the research. Arrangement, style, memory, and delivery. Even this presentation itself, I had to go out. I had to do research, put all the slides together, you know, add some banners and everything. Uh, you know, I don't memorize presentations. I just kind of wing it. Um, and then deliver the presentation. And, and how effective it is or not remains to be seen. But uh, luckily, I'm not trying to convince anybody of anything. I'm just uh, trying to educate. But in the event of um, you know, using grammar, adding logic on top of that, that, that gives you rhetoric the, and the ability to kind of um, talk to people, to do that public speaking. That is something that we, we talk a little bit about uh, within masonry. So, a few more things about the trivium itself, the, the three sciences. Um, you have grammar, which is concerned with the thing as it's symbolized. So, you know, I'm looking at, at a tree out my window. So it's the tree as, you know, this platonic ideal of what is the substance of a tree. And then logic is the, th the tree as it's known. I can't say, you know, look at this truck across the street and say, no, that's a tree, because according to, you know, logic and what has already been determined that's not what a tree is and then rhetoric is concerning with the thing as it is communicated so if i'm really good at rhetoric i may be able to convince you that that truck across the street is in fact a tree um if you know i was i was good at rhetoric and that was from uh sister miriam joseph who was a uh she was an influential educator in uh early early to late 1900s um and she wrote a book about the trivium in education. She taught at St. Mary's College, I believe, um, not the one in uh, in Maryland, but so she she taught there using these three basic building blocks as the the cornerstone of of the education. So, you know, the trivium is is knowledge understood, you know, with with logic, and then transmitted outward as as wisdom through rhetoric. So, it's it's you know it's these three things they're shown as a, as a star but it it almost a lot of the times rhetoric itself was was prized above all of those because you really need to have grammar and logic before you can do much with rhetoric now moving on to the the quadrivium you know we've got uh arithmetic we've got geometry music and uh, astronomy um and how those apply to the, the arts and sciences and and again this was something that uh plato first started talking about before anybody really had lumped the the trivium together as a separate thing but these so these kind of have a slightly different focus but they are all connected so you know our, our ancient friend and philosopher the great pythagoras he um with, within his schools, with his um, train of thought and his educational uh, group, they thought that um, mathematical science can be divided into four parts. So half deal with quantity and the other half with, with magnitude. And each one of those, again, could be divided in half. So, you know, quantity is the character by itself or in relation to another quality. And then magnitudes were stationary or in motion. So arithmetic, is just plain quantities. Music is the relation between quantities. Geometry is is magnitudes because you have the the extra dimensions to deal with. And then spherics or astronomy is magnitudes inherently moving. And the way these four arts and sciences are are paired up is is pretty interesting because um, you know you kind of think music is just something that that's a well-rounded Renaissance man. And astronomy, you're like, well, you know, maybe biology or chemistry would have would have been better suited. But in the, 
the same way that the, the blocks of the trivium build off of each other, each one of these um, sciences, again, build off of each other and supply a different way of, of looking at some of this knowledge. So, you know, arithmetic is the study of numbers and the basic operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and, and division. And, you know, math wasn't especially my strongest point. I, I think I could probably hack it with, with arithmetic. Um, although we were talking earlier and I couldn't remember uh, what year it was or something. Um, but this is an idea that, again, was discovered pretty early on in, in human society. And it was discovered, I say independently, throughout the world. So the earliest written records come from Egyptian and Babylon. And there's evidence that they used all four of the operations, so addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, as early as 2000 BC. So right here, there's also a picture. It's called the uh, Ishango bone, City Museum in uh, in Belgium, I believe. And it's an old bone from um, something. I think it was a uh, uh, the femur of a of a monkey. And there's a little piece of quartz on the end of this right here. And on this on this bone itself are a bunch of of um, of tick marks, a bunch of of lines, and so it's led a lot of scientists to to conclude that maybe this is the earliest example of counting, of tallying something, of keeping track of something. And then when you're keeping track of something, you have the ability to add, subtract, um, multiply, divide. So it's it's really primitive early indicator of of um arithmetic kind of like you know an abacus as well ended up being used uh later on to help um compute different things and so each different group kind of had a lot of different ways to deal with numbers with counting with addition with subtraction but once the uh, hindu arabic numeral system um was was established where you could use the same digit from zero to nine in each of the any of the places so you know your ones your tens your hundreds your thousands being able to use that same digit without having to come up with um different ideas even kind of roman numerals did the same thing um that made things a lot simpler um to be able to only have to worry about 10 digits and how they related to each other you could have decimals you could have fractions and parts and they also used uh this idea of zero which you know philosophically is an interesting concept because it's easy enough to visualize and and think about one of something but to think about none of something that takes you know a little bit more thinking and then to be able to to symbolize it and and convey it is is a pretty big um developmental step so being able to do that kind of let this this number system represent both large and small integers because of of how flexible it was so geometry it's mathematics and it's concerned with uh shape size position of figures and the properties of space and again this is another um branch that arose independently in early cultures to deal with lengths areas and volumes so either buying and selling things filling up um baskets or probably not boxes but baskets uh baskets clay vessels to be able to figure out how much something could contain to be able to to sell in a marketplace and even expanding onto the idea of architecture of being able to to build and have the different shapes and to compute how far away from this pillar this other part needed to be to make an arch and how you know how many stones you would need to put in this arch to make it fit so this is all stuff that independently with different civilizations they all needed to deal with the same problem and they all kind of came up with pretty similar solutions to it so that began to get added in formal mathematics um in the, the time of the ancient Greeks around 6th century BC. And, you know, like I mentioned, there's lots of applications within architecture. And, you know, this, this, I took this line from Wikipedia because it, it rings true to what um, 
you know, masonry talks about a little bit as well in that, you know, with stone masonry, with using stones to build, build buildings, um, there's a little bit of discussion about architecture and what that means as well. So it's that um, Ben said that geometry lies at the core of architectural design, which, you know, makes sense if you can't draw a square or a cube, you know, you're not going to be able to to draw a house. So having that that strong foundation, again, is extremely important. An interesting little tidbit I, I stumbled across when I was doing this research is um, President uh, Garfield, who was the 20th president, he discovered his own proof of the Pythagorean theorem. So that's the one, um, you know, the A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And that's the, the idea that if you've got, you know, this is A, this is B, you square those, that's going to equal C. And that helps you um, discover the area of a triangle. But he figured it out with the area of a trapezoid, which, um, again, math isn't my strong suit, so I'm not going to walk through this. But um, you have this idea of uh, half the sum of the bases. So, you know, you add these together. Um, divide that by two and then multiply it by the height. Um, I think that gives you uh, the area of a trapezoid. And if you break it down into the idea of the areas of three triangles, you get this formula, which when you simplify it, yields a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And, you know, another interesting thing about, you know, President Garfield is that he was also a Freemason. So this is actually a pretty good um, instance of a Freemason studying and, and applying themselves to geometry. That was always something that, that he was interested in and kind of had a different way of looking at this kind of classic um, problem. So it's it's pretty interesting that he did that. And with geometry and even with with mathematics you know you get a lot of um using these rules using these laws of geometry to um to determine and to prove certain conditions so you again are using these building blocks of of logic of condensing these arguments into you know a b and um knowing that if one thing is true if you know that this is the area of a tr of a triangle that you can find different ways to compute that you can um you use that to find the areas of other different things so being able to kind of have this um this logic and pairing it up with with arithmetic and with geometry is really a a powerful thing to to be able to do so music, um, you know, that was the Wikipedia page for it. You know, there's there's plenty out there about music, but in terms of what it would be as a one of the liberal arts and sciences, in its general form, it's um, describing music as an art form or cultural activity, um, and that can be creating works of music, songs, tunes, symphonies the criticism of music, the study of history of music, and the aesthetic examination of music. So it could be anything from listening to a performance to performing yourself, to um, critiquing a piece of music, to, to critiquing a performance. So there's, there's a lot you can do with it. But um, again, music notation itself is largely um, symbolic. You have these notes that correspond to different frequencies, which is again a, a batch of specific numbers. You have time signatures, um, rhythm notation, and the in interesting description of music that I'd seen in terms of how it relates to arithmetic and geometry, it's when you start to add time into this equation. So if you have like a four four rhythm count, you know, you're counting to four but you're doing it at at intervals of time which if you think about it is a pretty advanced idea besides like you know oh i have this this static number or i have this this square i'm drawing this is adding you know a complete other dimension of of time to to the equation where you're splitting up this 
these numbers, these frequencies, these notes, and you're doing it on a specific beat on a specific time. And if you play too, if you play fast, it's a diff it's different. If you play slow, it's different. If you you know syncopate the the beat and change it all the time, it's it's different. So there's again a lot of different things you can do within music with these these numbers, but it's still breaking up this this line of time into into distinct measurements and you know you can have quarter notes half notes all all sorts of of different varieties so in terms of how it builds off of this idea of of mathematics of numbers um it's it's a pretty interesting concept and and definitely makes sense when you think about it in in those sorts of terms and you know looking back again music is something that has been around for as long as as people so here's a bone flute that's 41,000 years old somebody found a bone drilled some holes in it and and started blowing on it to make interesting sounds and and from there you know it's interesting to think that music that um could have was most likely around before these advanced systems of math but to play the music you're still doing one of the more complex ideas of dividing time to be able to play these these songs within within a rhythm. So astronomy is, you know, this natural science that studies celestial objects and phenomenon. And when we were dealing with the ancient Greeks, I mean, this is basically, you know, they didn't have telescopes. They were dealing with things that that they could see with the naked eye. And a lot of it was um, just conjecture, just trying to figure out how things could move and how the planets you know rotated and, and that sort of thing so it is one of the oldest natural sciences because you know people observed what was around them they observed the the night sky so you see stars you find the shapes in the stars that's kind of where we get the the zodiac signs and the different constellations you can see that some stars aren't moving because they're um or they move at a different rate than other stars because they're they're further away or they're planets and there's a whole um wide range of, of things you can kind of just determine from from looking up at the the night sky and this is something again that's that's goes across all cultures you know babylonians greeks indians egyptians chinese mayan many indigenous people of the americas they were looking at the stars, trying to figure out, you know, how the planets are rotating, if they can determine, you know, the seasons, if they, you know, how long it's been since since uh, the previous winter. So all those sorts of things were, you know, necessary to try to figure out from astronomy. So carrying that on into the Renaissance time, and I like this. Um, you know this this little blurb here because it it gives you an idea this is kind of like the big names but of the the massive amount of of innovative thinking that was going on at the time so you know there were a couple people who talked about the heliocentric model of the solar system so the uh you know the planets revolve around the sun instead of around the earth so copernicus talked about that um you know we all know Gal uh galileo um got in a lot of trouble. He was under house arrest, you know, not unlike all of us now. Um, so hopefully, maybe, maybe we'll be able to see some stars out here. But yeah, so Galileo was was also interested and, and believed that principle as well. He worked on developing um, telescope and then his work was carried on by Johannes Kepler. And he was the one that described the details of the motion of the planet. So the the way the solar system moved um, but he didn't he didn't come up with a theory about that. He just kind of you know explained it, but didn't have a a proper like logical theory with all the arguments and measurements and things like that. So then uh, Isaac Newton, once he kind of had those building blocks in place, was also able to then explain really how the planets themselves were moving. Um, and he also developed another type of telescope to help aid in these. Um, these endeavors. So kind of in summation of the quadrivium, 
it's you know the study of number and the trivium deals more with with words with letters with with symbols um and then the quadrivium kind of moves from words and objects to numbers and what you can do with numbers and how they relate to space or time so arithmetic that's numbers geometry is a number in space so you have your your three dimensions and music you know like i said it's it's a number in time within a, a time signature within notation and then astronomy was number in space and time so you've got this uh, you know geometry in space but then you also have time of how these these celestial objects are moving and how you can track the movement of these different objects in space during time so you know initially going into this you're kind of like hearing about the seven liberal arts and sciences you hear music and you hear astronomy and they kind of seem more like uh ones that could probably be replaced but then when you you look at it in these terms it you know makes sense it follows that these are all still extremely important building blocks and and milestones of thought to be able to to learn these these ideas at the time and morris klein who was a, a mathematician again described the quadrivium in, in the same sort of way so it's it's pure when it's just arithmetic when you're just dealing with numbers stationary is geometry so you know nothing's moving you're just dealing with numbers length depth height it starts to move and you get astronomy and then i guess really you could also get physics too but um yeah we can we can delve into that later and then it's applied when you start using this number in time and you're actually controlling it and and you have a little bit more um which is interesting because that is one you have more control and you're interacting with number and time uh within music which is a pretty interesting conception so how do all these relate to masonry we have this um the symbolism behind us where we have the idea of architecture um of building um these these vast objects these monuments um these temples and we use these metaphors of building uh to use um we use them to to explain how we can kind of improve ourselves so with a focus on education um what sorts of different things you can learn how how do how do we apply grammar logic rhetoric all of these different arts and sciences to masonry into our everyday lives so you know grammar that does teach us to speak clearly and and concisely if you uh, can't form coherent sentences then it's you know you're gonna lose a lot of people in your presentations so uh, yeah i haven't been able to see what what the numbers are during this but you know if if you're just prone to babbling on you know you you tend to your audience tends to shrink um and we use all of our uh faculties to of conceiving judging reasoning and disposing of questions before us so you know logic trains the mind to think clearly so sincerity and plain dealing and logic should distinguish any any mason and we see actions that help one person but they may not help all people so we learn to avoid arguments that something's true or false based you know instead of on who says it but based on its inherent truth about these these logical statements and you know with rhetoric that's we can convince our brothers to you know sign up for a blood drive to sign up for a committee to attend meetings to give presentations to learn lectures um you know if you're skillful you use tact to admonish brothers so if somebody is you know posting inappropriately on facebook you know you can say hey you know that's not really masonic character that, that you're emulating and so you know you can use rhetoric to applaud excellent and and conduct you can there's a lot that you can do with it and i do like this idea of really you need to use rhetoric logic grammar if you're going to convince you know 
secretary and treasurer and the lodge to to okay um big ideas that you may have yeah you may think it's a great idea but unless you can convince everybody of this you're not going to have much luck you know we we load the idea of having to to raise dues and it may be something that personally you're opposed to but if the person discussing something like raising dues is able to uh, coherently state why, use logical statements instead of, you know, quit being cheap or, you know, we have to do this. You say, no, if you invest this money now, this is the payoff for later. And it, it really can help convince people that while they may be personally opposed to something, it is something that is beneficial to to a group and that's kind of an important uh thing to to distinguish that you know it may not be the best for you but if it's the best for the group it may actually end up being the best for you um so within math there's there's this great uh quote that i found and it said you know in terms of mathematics add to your knowledge never subtract from the character of your neighbor multiply your benevolence to your fellow creatures and divide your means with those in need. So, I mean, that's a really good way, you know, metaphor of how you can apply mathematics to your everyday life besides just general um, being able to add and compute bills and that sort, sort of thing. Um, within geometry, you use plums, squares, levels, you use compasses. I'm not sure why that wasn't added in this uh, discussion, but you know, use all of the, oh, maybe that's calculus, I guess, but uh, you use all of these um, specific tools within geometry, within architecture, within building buildings, and we have symbolic meanings behind all of these, and, and they're usually about refining your character, about becoming a better person. So they're basic tools of operative masons. Masons are actually go out and build brick walls, and we use them in speculative masonry to teach lessons of right behavior, rectitude, uprightness, and, and truthfulness, truthfulness, being level with everybody, um, acting on, on the square. So again, these are all tools of geometry. These are, you know, why they are important. So music, again, it seemed harder to kind of find a good explanation of why music is important to Masons. And, you know, there is a, uh, a chaplain or a, uh, an organist in the Grand Lodge and you know you go to a lot of lodge buildings and they've got a uh, piano or an organ from the 70s sitting in a corner that may or may not have been touched since the 70s and this this poor organist has to go to uh, you know an installations or other ceremonies and you know this poor guy's got to try to play on these horribly out of tune malfunctioning devices and so you know if it goes over well, then it does add um, some more atmosphere, some more uh, a deeper experience to the to the the ritual or to the um, you know installation ceremony. But I like this idea that that music is part of us. So our heartbeat is a basic pattern. So you know, kind of one of the first things you hear, you feel, you kind of have this. Um, hopefully fairly well functioning metronome of the of this kind of constant beat behind us so you know you hear the first cry of a baby and then you know our last breath uh, we improve our sense of hearing we can recognize songs rhythms kind of like um grammar where you learn from hearing it's the same kind of idea with music you learn to recognize songs rhythms uh instruments um, you know, clapping and singing, all of that is, is part of what makes us humans. And, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that, you know, within lodges ourselves, we have a lodge ode and we uh, sing this Irishish song um, at the end of, of some of our meetings. And it kind of, it, it does instill a sense of, of brotherhood to be able to, to do something like this together. Even at the end of, of table lodges, we sing Auld Lang Syne. So it's, um, you know, you get this experience of of music that's hard to articulate, but being within it kind of helps um, kind of solidify a crowd. But there's also within 
our lectures within some of the discussions we have, there is it, some of it's poetic and it's got a rhythm, it flows. And if you can find this rhythm, this flow while you're talking and delivering these lectures, then it makes them a lot easier. It makes them them more pleasing to the ear and, and hopefully people are able to uh, understand them a little bit better. So, and then, you know, astronomy, it said that fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. So, you know, looking up at the universe, looking up at this this night sky, um, you know, we're here on the East Coast, it's, there's a decent amount of light pollution, but even I'm up in Frederick now, which is starting to get further away from DC and Baltimore, and, and you do get to see more stars up here at night. And I've been out, you know, in Arizona and, you know, the Midwest and where it's just pitch black at night. And it's, it's really vivid seeing the stars out there and you kind of, it does instill fear and, and the sense of glory of the universe of, of how vast everything is that there's this entire world that's well beyond the world, the, this entire universe that is, I mean, it's always there. It's just during the day we kind of, it's, it's washed away. We don't really see it, but once you get, um, you know, night coming, then it's, it's, gives you a lot more to to look at and i like these i this idea of um you know one of my favorite i guess is it's a constellation or a cluster of stars it's the the pleiades the seven sisters it's a small group of of stars and you know different societies different groups have um different stories for how these these stars got up in there got got up in the the sky so the greeks had orion he's the hunter um, he was after these seven sisters and and one of the gods to keep them away from him, put them up in the sky on top of uh, this bear, or this lion that he's hunting. And that's why he's going after the the Big Dipper and they're sitting on the top of it. Another variation um, in uh, uh, one Native American tribe is, again, it's these seven sisters that were getting chased by a bear. They went to this this spot and and prayed and they got raised up into the sky. Um, and it's where uh, Devil's Tower National Park is in, uh, in Wyoming. And you know the idea is there's all these scratches in the side of this big granite column from, from the bear, and the, but then that's how they ended up in the sky. So it's interesting that with astronomy, with these ideas of people looking at the sky and having this sense of wonder, um, really got them thinking about what's out there besides themselves and how things like that um, happened. So in the second degree, which is when we discuss a lot of this, um, we discuss that Freemasonry is a system of morality veiled in allegory and illustrated by symbols. So we have all of these symbols of arts and sciences, of the virtues, of tools of architecture, and we use them to talk about morality and we have this allegory of um, King Solomon's temple to kind of help show a good character, a good person, and how we can use these tools to be a good person. So yeah, we mentioned uh, two weeks ago in the first degree, which talks about the virtues, it's about purification, it's about becoming a good person. So the second degree focuses on illumination, about learning, about education, and, and you learn a lot during the ritual of this, this degree. Um, so it kind of prepares you once, um, after you've realized that the whole point of, of your joining this is to become a better person, it prepares you to learn more of the tools to be able to do that. And then there's a transformation in the third degree that kind of completes the process. So it's, it's laying the foundation. It's, well, it's building on the foundation from the first degree and preparing you for, for the third degree. So uh, the basic takeaways from this is we have this Masonic education, but it's rooted on human education. The, this is something that since yeah, the beginning of time, these are all things people have studied and, and focused on, and it's part of who we are just as humans to, to learn and to think about these things. Um, but at the seven liberal arts and sciences themselves, they're necessary building blocks for just all other forms of knowledge. If you don't have these these basics, then 
everything's going to be a lot harder. And, uh, you know, reading about the education, the different education systems, there's some colleges that, that do just focus on going back to basics, to reading these original texts from, from Plato or, and, and Pythagoras and, and Kepler and learning that way, going back to the, to the original sources to learn where this, these ideas, these thoughts came from. And, you know, of course, the cheesy um, scientia potentia est, knowledge is power, which is a Latin phrase that is attributed to Francis Bacon. He may have heard it from Thomas Hobbes because he was Thomas Hobbes' secretary. Um, Hobbes was was kind of a little bit of a pessimist. Um, but yeah, this so this translation varies, but then it's again something that has been said throughout time. Different cultures, different ages all have something similar, the same ideas that that permeate them that you know, the more you learn about stuff, the more you can can do. And the same holds through for, for masonry and for generally just uh, everyday life. So um, we'll we'll do some questions. If anybody has any questions, there's the uh, the chat feature because it'll still get um, cluttered within the uh, within the, the app. And then um, I'll stop recording in a little bit and we can all just uh, chat and relax. But We've got an email address for it's education at silverspring215.org. Um, reach out to us if you know you're a member of another lodge and and you want to subject them to to me yammering on. Um, if you want to share it, if you have any other questions, um, feel free to reach out. And we have a YouTube channel. This uh, URL is not very helpful, but we need 100 subscribers before we can get a nice uh, usable URL here. So, um, yeah. Follow our channel, subscribe. Uh, probably tonight or tomorrow, I'll put this this video up so uh, we can share that as well. And and again, this is just something that we're putting out there to teach people about masonry, about what we do, about uh, you know what they can expect to hear about, to learn about when uh, when they join. So I'm gonna stop recording and then uh, go answer any questions.